Late 2007 marked a return to competition for ATI. The aggressively priced HD 3800 series was becoming a thorn in Nvidia's side, with its affordability starting to win over many mid-range gamers. At the forefront of this, however, was the value champion, the Radeon HD 3850. Let's dive right into its specifications. It's using the Pro variant of the RV670 GPU, which has all 320 shading units, same as the full chip, but is clocked lower at 668 MHz. As for its VRAM configuration, it's using 512MB of GDDR3 clocked at 830 MHz, running on a 256-bit bus making for a total memory bandwidth of 53GB per second. It supports up to DirectX 10.1 and OpenGL 3.3, which does give it some degree of longevity today, but overall, most games and applications have moved on to newer versions of these APIs, so keep in mind a lot of newer applications will not function on this card. It consumes a reasonable 75 watts of power, so pretty much any typical PSU will be able to power the card just fine. ATI's ambitious HD2900 XT had gotten beat quite badly by Nvidia's 8800 GTX. As a result, ATI decided to switch up their strategy. The HD2900 XT's R600 was a very large and complex GPU, and as such it was pretty much impossible to make it a reasonable price. Enter RV670. It was manufactured on the shiny new 55nm node, allowing them to pack the same amount of power into a GPU less than half the size, along with less than half the power draw as well. Thanks to this, it was much cheaper as well, with the HD3870 retailing at $270 rather than $400. At this lower price point, the HD3870 was competing with Nvidia's venerable 8800 GT, which it did fairly well against. It was a slower card, but was cheaper and a little more available. So where does the HD3850 fit in here? Well, it was a slightly cut down RV670, dubbed RV670 Pro, sporting lower clocks and its bigger brother along with GDDR3 memory to keep costs down. As a result, the HD3850 was a sub $200 card, meaning it was mainly competing against the incredibly slow 8600 GTS and HD2600 XT. As to be expected, it handily defeated both cards, performing much better at a competitive price too. As such, the card was a popular choice amongst mid-range gamers thanks to the huge performance uplift it offered over its last-gen counterparts. To compete with the HD3850, Nvidia launched the faster 8800 GT256MB, but it was too expensive to be a good contender, so the HD3850 was still coming out on top overall. This card was purchased locally for 10 bucks, and despite the low price, it was actually in really good condition. Aside from a bit of dust, but that's to be expected on a card of this age. Let's have a quick look around the card. If you couldn't already guess, this card is made by Diamond, specifically being the Viper Ruby edition, which is overclocked to 725MHz on core and 900MHz on memory. We'll be comparing stock HD3850 speeds along with the factory overclock later in the benchmarks. Anyhow, the cooler isn't anything special, being a standard hunk of aluminum with a quiet, medium-sized fan. Looks-wise, the card looks pretty nice. The simple metal shroud gives it a clean look overall. Changing the thermal paste was really simple as only four screws hold on the cooler. The old stuff had long since dried out, so after a quick change, low temperatures dropped 5 degrees Celsius. It's not a huge decrease or anything, but it's still a good practice when it comes to these old cards. Well, there's not much else to say, so let's get right into the benchmarks. Test system specs are on screen if you're interested. Like I mentioned earlier, I'll be comparing this card with stock speeds and its factory overclock. Let's see what it can do in some games. First up, we have Tomb Raider, running in 720p with a low preset. The card managed an average frame rate of 64 FPS, with 1% lows down to 51. When overclocked, averages rose 11% to 71 FPS, with 1% lows rising 10% to 56. Although the game did not look great, frame times were rock solid here making for a great experience. Considering the card's age, I was pretty impressed with these results. Next up, we have CSGO running in 720p with the low settings and shadows set to high. It managed an average frame rate of 78 FPS, with 1% lows down to 41. When overclocked, averages rose 9% to 85 FPS, with 1% lows rising 7% to 44. Although not competitive, the game ran pretty well overall. Still didn't keep me from getting wrecked though. 
Next up is Half-Life 2, running in 1080p with the high settings with no AA. The card managed an average frame rate of 92 FPS, with 1% lows down to 62. When overclocked, averages rose 9% to 100 FPS, with 1% lows rising 8% to 67. The game looked really great and played very well thanks to those stable frame times. Not much else to say other than it was a wonderful experience. Next up we have the latest version of Minecraft, running with Optifine in 1080p with the fast settings. It got an average frame rate of 89 FPS, with 1% lows down to 36. When overclocked, averages rose 5% to 93, with 1% lows rising 6% to 38. As to be expected with Minecraft, we experienced some poor frame times as shown in the 1% lows. However, for the most part, the game would only stutter when loading chunks, so in the end it wasn't too bad at all. Finally, we have Just Cause 2, running in 1080p with the low settings. The card managed an average frame rate of 45 FPS, with 1% lows down to 33. When overclocked, averages rose 9% to 49, with 1% lows rising 6% to 35. Frame times were pretty good overall. If you dropped the resolution, you'd see much higher frame rates, but I preferred the higher visual fidelity offered at 1080p. Another great showing from this old card. To conclude, I'm pretty impressed with what this part managed. Although you're definitely not going to run any new AAA games on it, when it comes to some newer titles, the card showed impressive results despite its age. However, I can't really recommend the HD3850 as a budget card. There are plenty of options in its price range like the HD5770 that outperform it while being newer as well for greater API support. Even so, the card is an interesting part of ATI's history and is from one of my favorite eras of consumer graphics cards. In a future video, I might pair this card with my HD 3870X2 for some crossfire fun, so stay tuned. Anyway, that'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.